Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. We're so glad you've decided to join us, and now we invite you to grab your Bible, if you're able, as we pray that you will be blessed by the preaching of the truth of God's Word today. You would take out your copy of God's Word with me and turn to the Gospel according to St. Matthew. The Gospel according to St. Matthew. Chapter 2. Incidentally, Happy Epiphany. Or Merry Epiphany. I'm not sure which. But this is Epiphany Sunday. This is the Sunday that we remember the coming of the Magi. And their role in identifying the Messiah, in, in kind of singling Him out, following the star, following the signs. And there are many misconceptions about this day, many misconceptions about this story. Many times that we reduce the story down to, uh, to try to fill one day. Now, as I shared with the Sunday school class downstairs, um, this wasn't always the case. The church universal, the church before Rome, used to make a big deal out of its calendar. It used to use every day of the week. It used to use the very activities that we have of coming together as a church and the different months, the different seasons as teaching tools in instructing us about the life of the Savior and about the birth and the ministry of the church, how it took off, how its ministry took up the mantle that Jesus left to her and kept going the ministries of reconciliation, the ministries of love, the ministries of charitable outreach, the ministries of preaching and teaching that there is a God. And He is a sovereign God, but He is a loving God. So Epiphany is the day that we remember the wise men and what their gifts represent. So um, this, this sermon is going to be a, a little different. What I'm going to be doing is more expounding to you the Word of God through what the gifts literally represented, what they figuratively represented, and what our purpose is in thinking about them in the first place. How do we reflect that today? What are the considerations that we bring? What are the gifts that we bring to our Savior? as we consider who He is, remember the gift that God gave for us. So, Matthew 2, starting with verse 1. When you get there in your copy of God's Word, please say Amen. Heavenly Father, please bless the reading of Your Word just now so that we might both dine extravagantly from its table, be nourished by its pages, and grow to maturity in You. In the most holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the, the, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born the King of the Jews? For we saw, saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, Herod is an interesting figure. Herod the Great was a great builder in Jerusalem. He reconstructed the temple to something that became one of the wonders of the ancient world of its day. He rebuilt Jerusalem to not only be a more modernized city of the Roman Empire, but one that was the envy of many. It was the crossroads of trade between Europe and the Far East. It was also the crown jewel in the Arabian Peninsula, one which the... the, the Persian Empire wanted desperately back in the day, and that the new and upcoming Parthian Empire, which was the now the rival of Rome, wanted desperately right now. The only reason that Herod, who was himself not a Jew, he, King Herod, was not Jewish by birth. He was, uh, if memory serves, 
He was a descendant of Esau. He was one of the, one of the tribes from around Jerusalem, and he was picked because he was a Roman sympathizer. And the only claim that he had to Jerusalem was the fact that Rome wanted him there. And his power over the Jewish people was hung by a thread because he was not a popular guy. So effectively, he kept bribing the Jews in, in Judea and in Israel to maintain the peace of Rome in that city. And he was also known to be a person of cruelty in his own age. He became more and more paranoid. The older that he got, he executed his own children because he adopted the dress and tried to placate the Jewish authority in the temple. It was often joked about him that it was, it was safer to be Herod's pig than one of his own children. He was not a nice guy. If any of his nobles even looked at him the wrong way, that person was destroyed and executed. He was a person of intrigue. He was a person that knew he was hanging on by a thread and lived constantly in that fear, in that paranoia, in that cruelty. And when representatives, the Magi were not kings. The Magi were royal officials, ambassadors. They were the high learned ones of the Parthian Empire. They were the ones whose ancestors Daniel had been over generations and generations ago. They were the same body, the same august body that King Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel the head of back in the book of Daniel. So when these people come all the way from Persia, when they come to Jerusalem, a city that's already under conflict, a city that's already under a Roman heel and a king that was not sure of his own power and they wanted to know who it is born that is the king of the Jews, all of a sudden Herod got anxious. This person that was known to be cruel, this person that was known to get things done by the tip of a sword. You can imagine what started going on in his mind. Again, the competing empire to the east, the grand army that Rome could never destroy, the people who were rich, the people who were influential, the people who were the enemy. Now comes to the king's doorstep. And he asks, where is now the new king? We have saw his star. And we've come to worship him. And when King Herod saw this, when he heard this, he was what? He was disturbed. And not only was he disturbed, but all of Jerusalem was with him. There were more than just three people that came in. We, we kind of assigned that because there were three gifts. But there was a large caravan. There would had to be. These were royal officials and they were rich. Chances are good they came with their own military, their own army. They had their own secretaries with them, their own squares. They had all the creature comforts. Of course they would. They're royal officials. So when this grand group of people coming from the Parthian Empire enters into a Roman city of Jerusalem and they go up to the king and they demand, where is the new king? The whole city shuts down. Because the whole city remembers the promise. He was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When they had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. They get upset. So what do they do? They call the experts. The experts ram through the books of the prophets and they find Bethlehem of Judah. This small, little, out of the way town. This place where the King David, the person on which the rest of the kingdom had been founded centuries ago, from his line, from his city, is where the new Messiah, the new king would come. So the king would have an austere name. The king would supposedly have an austere birth. Heaven knows it's from the right place. It's from the right family. Now, 
when we look back at the conditions in which Jesus was born, we kind of kind of uh, we remember the the humility of it all, and for good reason. But God has always had His hand on His servants, particularly those from the past. He reminds the people of their of their current experience by reflecting on where they've come from. The king will come from the place of kings. He will be born in the birthplace of the kings. He will come from the line of the kings. You see how the Bible is pulling all of this together. Not only that, Bethlehem is significant for another reason. The word Bethlehem in Hebrew translates as house of bread. I don't know if you know that or not. We celebrated communion last week, if you'll remember. Who is called the bread of life? Why does this have significance? It has significance because it points to who Jesus is. Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child as soon as they will find him. Report to me so that I may, I too may go and may worship him. And after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose up ahead of them. I want you to notice that. About this time of year, observatories all over the world claim that they have discovered the Bethlehem star, that it was a conjunction of different planets, that it was a phenomenon where the earth was in just a search and such place so that this one particular eastern passing star looks its brightest and all this, that, and the other. Or maybe it was a, a hidden tome because these guys were known to be astro astronomers, excuse me, not necessarily astrologers, even though there was a theological emphasis behind what they did. But I've never heard of a star staying in one place and then moving. According to the witness of Scripture here, when this star appeared, it, it came and it follow, it, they followed it. And then it halted. And then when they had finished taking care of this, delivering this royal message, it kept on moving. Have you ever heard of something like that happening from an, astro an astronaut, from a star standpoint? This was unique. This was not just astronomy. This was a sign from God. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and they started. The, they had seen when it rose, it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, no, notice that it's no longer the manger, no longer the stable. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures, and they presented them with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let me give you the significance of that really quickly. In the Bible, as I've talked to you many times, numbers, substances, building materials, colors, all of it has a prophetic meaning, a prophetic significance, a pattern that lets you know that the Holy Spirit is behind what's going on. Gold as a substance identifies royalty, majesty, that which is above. Frankincense is a key ingredient in incense. It is part of the, ta the, ta the tabernacle and later on the temple incense. It identifies someone from a priestly standpoint. It is something that is burned that gives the smell of the place, the smell of the holy. Uh, worshiping with all of your senses, not just with sight and sound. But in the case of frankincense, frankincense is a key identifier of someone who is part of the priestly line, or someone who has a religious significance. Myrrh, on the other hand, if you remember in the book of Revelation, the word Smyrna, the name of that church, literally means myrrh, or scent of death. 
Myrrh is a perfume, an embalming agent. It is something that is used to anoint the bodies of the deceased to help prepare them for burial. It is also something that is used as an analgesic. It has to be crushed in order to be used. It is a, a sap, a rasin, a rosin, excuse me, that hardens up to an amber that is then crushed into a powder. And occasionally, medicinally, it is mixed with wine to stymie someone who is in great pain. So you have royalty, you have holiness, and you have sacrifice. I pick on the song three, We Three Kings because we, several undeterminate royal officials of great numbers coming to Jerusalem, just doesn't have the same ring as We Three Kings of Orient are. That one sounds better in a hymn. But gold, frankincense, and myrrh, king and God and sacrifice. We're getting a foretaste of what is to come. On having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now we know the end of the story. Herod goes insane. Herod, who is already in a precarious situation. Herod, who is already paranoid. Herod, who is already a megalomaniac. Who is filled and conflicted between the high of the day and Augustus Caesar. Who thinks that enemies are surrounding him. Who's always afraid for his own life. So he strikes first and asks questions later. Herod, who butchers his own children, decides that if the wise men have betrayed me, then I have to take action for myself. And as a result, knowing that the child must be in Bethlehem, knowing that he can be no more than two years old, knowing that he is still a small child and in a weak and vulnerable state, he sends every soldier in his command to make sure that this rival king that the Parthians would have their eyes on, that's, this is his own rationalization, has to be dealt with before he can ensue a rebellion. So they sharpen their swords. And they commit genocide in their own, in their own land. Fortunately, the child would escape thanks to the intervention of his father. An angel of the Lord was sent to Joseph. We know that story too. And he flees to, uh, he flees to Egypt. And tradition tells us that the gold was used to purchase or escape. The story continued. So what were the gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts from the other side of the world. Gifts from the pagan kings. Gifts of worship. Gifts of royalty. Gifts that announced the purpose of this child. The purpose of the earthly ministry of Christ. Christ himself was royal, but he wasn't rich. And he wasn't rich by choice. He chose later on in his life to be an itinerant pastor. He chose... It, Foxes have their dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his, his head. He chose to be homeless, effectively, to gather his disciples around him, to preach to the crowds, to preach to the multitudes, tens of thousands of people in his lifetime, from the Sea of Galilee to the far north of Israel, all the way down to the Dead Sea that, that is surrounding Jerusalem. He travels Hundreds of miles gathering followers in the tens of thousands, teaching them about the love of God, about the, the, the understanding of what sin is. He challenges the religious authorities of their day. He, he makes no friends there except for a few that recognize him for who he is. He gets persecuted. He gets spat on. Ultimately, he gets called an enemy of God's own people. And he gets put to death for it. 
the King of kings, the Prince of all creation, who is richer by far than any who have ever lived. Because he owns it all. He chose to give it all up. We don't know what happened to the frankincense, but we know what it represents. He taught, he expounded, he gave them the Word of God in fullness and completeness and clarity. He didn't try to argue his own perspective or give himself a sense of grandeur like the flowing robes in the high places that the priests of his day tried to assume for themselves. He instead remained poor, remained humble, remained in the faces of the people that he cared for. When sin was sin, he called it out. For the proud, the mighty, and the privileged, he did call them to be responsible, to be loving, to be charitable. In fact, the rich young ruler, when he asked, what more must I do to inherit everlasting life? Jesus called him out on his back and forth talk because he said, if you've accomplished everything else in the law, do this and you can be not my disciple. Go and sell all of your possessions and give it all to the poor. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Give it all away because you don't need it. That's a challenge to a world addicted to wealth. The woman was caught in adultery. The Pharisees wanted to kill her. They wanted to use her story as a trap for Jesus. They brought her to a place of execution. They wanted Jesus to pick up the first stone to live out what they knew to be the law, what they thought He would do. Instead, He holds His peace. He gets down and He starts writing in the sand. Tradition tells us that what He was actually doing was calling out each individual Pharisee on their own sin, naming it in writing for all to see. And little by little, they did what? They got embarrassed and they walked away. Until all that was left was the Savior and the woman caught in her own sin. Where are your accusers? There are none left. Neither do I accuse you. But, go and sin no more. Forgiveness requires repentance. Jesus did not offer blanket forgiveness that you are good just as you are stuff didn't cut it because it never has with God. God always challenges us to be better. So He caught, called out the sins of those that claim to be just, the high and mighty. He called out their sins and their hypocrisies. But He also called out the sins of those on the other side, those who were caught knee-deep in sin, those that were shackled to sin, those that were chained to sin, those that were caught up in rebellion because they didn't know another way and because the devil himself had his teeth in them. But he did offer them forgiveness. He did offer them a way out. He did offer to break those chains. But he always, always, without exception, challenged them, go and sin no more. Forgiveness requires repentance. Finally, when the day came, the king of the Jews had that title inscribed upon a placard and placed upon a Roman tree. The Jewish authorities of the day got all upset. Don't say that he was the king of the Jews, but that he said he was the king of the Jews. Have you ever wondered why? See, when there's something that goes on underneath the text of the Bible that we don't understand, the Pharisees run to our rescue. When they get upset about something, pay attention. When they get upset about something that makes no sense to us, pay attention because there is something that the author is taking it for granted that you should know. That The chances are over the course of the millennium we don't anymore. We've forgotten about it. See, when he wrote Jesus, King of the Jews, The Hebrew letters, he, he spelled that out in Latin, the official legal language. He wrote out it in Greek. 
which became the language of the New Testament Koine Greek and was also the trade language popularized in all of the world at that time. Well, at least the known world. And that he wrote it in Hebrew, the religious language of the day. Yah-heh-veh-heh. Heh. The first letters of what he wrote were written in such a way to spell out the first letters of every word were written out in such a way that effectively the acrostic of that phrase identified Jesus as Yahweh. Don't write that! Take that plaque down! Don't say that he said. Change the wording just a little bit. Don't, don't say that he was, but that he said he was. And Pilate responded, what? What I have written, I have written. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Not only that, but this was the Son of God. So then the question comes. We've heard the story. We know the gifts. What gifts do we bring to Him? What gifts do we have for our Savior? Do we call him the King of kings and Lord of lords of our own lives? When he says, go and sin no more, do we pay attention? When he offers us repentance and the forgiveness of our sins, do we take him up on that? When he offers us a new way, do we hear his call? When he offers us the mission to know him better and to make him known throughout the earth, do we do that? Or do we sit idly by hoping that they'll just come to our doorstep? What are the gifts we bring. The book of Romans written by Paul is an exhaustive uh, document on Christian theology. The book of Ephesians talks a little bit more about what we call ecclesiology, the study of the church. This is part of what he offers us as our service, as our sacrificial giving in reflection to the God who loves us so. Ephesians chapter 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. I want you to notice the way that He phrases that. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another but not in an ordinary way. Not in the way that this world hints at, because that's a deluded love. That's a love with an agenda. That is a polluted love. But with a selfless, self-giving, self-sacrificing love. You must not love God with an agenda towards yourself. You must love Him with a selfless giving love. You must not love your neighbor made in his image with strings attached, with conditions. You must love that person with the same love that Jesus has for you. Selfless, self-giving, self-sacrificing. You must love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ in the same selfless, self-giving, self-sacrificial way that Christ loves you. Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for, the, for God's holy people. Notice what He links together. Sexual impurity. Sins against the image of God, in other words. Greed. Sins against the people of God that elevate the self above the other. Any kind of impurity. All of these are equal in God's eyes. All of them put a black mark on Him. But He's talking to the church. 
Don't wear the old clothes. Don't look like the rest of the world. Don't conform to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of what? Your minds. You have to be different. You have to look different. Your talk has to be different. Your conduct, conversation, character, the person you are internally in your heart as well as your mind, it all has to change. Nothing from the outside can be acceptable to what is on the inside because what is on the inside was redeemed by Christ, reformed by the Holy Spirit, transformed by a love that is without equal. So you have to go and reflect that love. Not only that, but you have to be obedient. To hear its call and obey. What is proper and right in their eyes has no place in Christ. For what does light have with darkness? What can good have in common with evil? What does sin have in common with righteousness? These things are improper for God's holy people. The church of the redeemed should act like it. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Praise to God. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance, inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Don't act like the lost. Don't be tempted into acting like an enemy of the cross. Let no one deceive you with empty words because of such things God's wrath comes to those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather, expose them. It is shameful to even mention what is disobedient to do in secret. But in everything... But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live. Not as the unwise, but as the, lot, the wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Do we do that? Do we tithe our time? just as we tithe our money. Do we even do that much? Do we come to the church living up to the commandment to do so when the brother of Christ tells us, do not give up, the, do not abandon the gathering of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more so as you see the day approaching. Every second that we're not in heaven, we should be considering meeting, fellowshipping, discipling together working, ministering together, relieving the poor and the afflicted together. Because the days are evil, the people need the light. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of a reverence for Christ. What gifts do we bring? There was an old Christmas hymn. It's called In the Bleak Midwinter. We played it here on Christmas Eve. It was written by a man named Gustav Holst. The poetry in one of their last verses is from the point of view of a little shepherd boy. What, well, an observer, I'll say, a poor observer. What can I give him, poor as I am? 
If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Do my part. But what can I give him? Christ doesn't want your substance. He owns it all anyway. Christ doesn't want your riches. Only in obedience to him. Christ doesn't want you to try to work yourself into heaven because he's already done that work for you. He does desire that we continue his ministry. But above all, he desires foundational. Under the desire for good works, under the desire to give for the relief of the poor, under the desire for all that we are as members of Christ's church, as the song reminds us, I will give him my heart. This is what he prizes above all else. The gold and the frankincense and the myrrh came to him to highlight who he is, who he is before us, who he is before God. Now as we approach Bethlehem for the last time before the changing of the season, as we reflect together, what do we bring him as we kneel before the child in the house? The Son of God. What do we bring to him? The challenge is the gift of ourselves. Our devotion. Most importantly, our love. And all God's people say. Heavenly Father, as we close the service of the Word, we ask that it would find fruit in the hearts of those who have heard it. Lord, we are nothing before you under our own merit. Yet you created us fearfully and wonderfully to be your children. You created us in your image as people who are of eternal significance and divine worth. You offer us the ministry of reconciliation. Help us now to embrace the calling for which we have been called. To kneel before you, the child of Bethlehem, the Christ of Calvary, the great high priest of heaven. We kneel before you. Accept the gift of our dedication, the gift of our love, the gift of ourselves as we pledge to you our service. Lord, whoever is in this place that has yet to come to know you in that way, with that intimacy, with that love, with that embrace, or whoever may be a brother or sister in Christ already, but uh, Lord, the weight of this world has removed their joy or, or has let slip their peace, whatever the case, Lord, if there are any that are struggling in their relationship with you, if there are any that are, are fighting with the tempter, if there are any that just need a special touch of the Master's hand, whatever it may be, even an encouraging one, bring them forward now to receive that touch, to receive that embrace. Or to be written in the book of life before it is everlastingly too late. Whatever the need is on any heart, Please bring them forward now before it is everlastingly too late. In the most holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us at High Lawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. At High Lawn, we believe that when you love God, you share His Word. When you love others, you spread the gospel. We would love for you to join us next time, and if possible, to join us in person. 
to contact or learn more about us, to donate to our ongoing ministry, or most importantly, to learn about the salvation offered to you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, visit us at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you and God bless you.